So we are doing working at height rescue. And as before, I'm showing you the references that you may use, should you so choose, to uh, uh, look into, into this uh, topic further. However, as I've noted previously, um, ANSI, ASSB, American Society of Safety Professionals, and OSHA really don't have a clue what we do. And their regulations and guidance documents, um, while you know good, has lots of really good information in them, do not necessarily address problems that we run into. And um, you know we work in an environment that they're not used to. And uh, the, uh, the ASSP, the American Society of Safety Professionals in particular, uh, have gone into great detail with, um, with their guidance for uh, rescue, both self-rescue and assisted rescue. And um, it's all well and good, but you will not find a, um, uh, a description or a recommendation for rescuing somebody who's fallen off of a front of house lighting catwalk. Uh, and is hanging above the seating area, um, you know, six feet below the catwalk and 25 feet above the seats. Um, they, they, they don't cover that because that's not what they know. Okay, so without further ado, right, the other couple of things here that we always uh, start off with, I'll be briefer this time. If I'm too brief for the new folks, please uh, yell at me. Um, where is, where is my chat room? There it is. Um, when working with working at height issues, it's a three-step process in determining how you're going to respond to that working at height hazard. And the entertainment industry typically starts with number three, uh, which is the wrong end. You, know, you really start with well, step number one. You want to remove the hazard whenever possible because rescuing somebody is a, a, a complicated and difficult situation and um, you want to avoid it. Step number one would, would avoid it if you just simply remove the hazard. Put that railing up, for example, that wasn't there before. Hazard goes away. Step two is to restrain the worker and that means that you are uh, not able to remove the hazard, but you are able to hold the worker, the technician, in a location where they can do their work, but they stay away from the hazard. Working on a platform that's 15 feet in the air, for example, they don't need to be at the very edge. You just have to protect them from accidentally walking off. So you would restrain them with a, some kind of a restrain, restraining lanyard back to an anchorage point that keeps them on the platform. Item three is the way you know, it usually ends up in our business, we have to do it this way, that we have to, you know, arrest, we have to uh, arrest the, uh, the worker, the technician. But um, as you'll see, as we talk about rescue in particular, it's complicated and you want to stay away from it as much as you possibly can. And here is an example of why. Uh, the rules for fall arrest, OSHA requirement for a single person um, system, the, the system, the safety system, and the components of that system, which each maintain a 5,000 pound tensile strength. Um, and the reason for that 5,000 pound tensile strength is that the actual amount of force required to arrest a fall uh, is going to be somewhere in the neighborhood of 3,000 pounds, you know, on average. Can go from, I've seen it go from 27 to 33, 2700 to 3300 in test uh, conditions. Yeah. Um, so we're looking at about 3000 on average. OSHA allows the maximum arresting force, meaning the amount of force it can get to your body to be 1800 pounds. And the goal is 900 pounds. Uh, Arresting a fall at 1,800 pounds is going to put a significant amount of force on your body, and it's going to put, and you're going to, it's going, it's going to result in, you know, injury. Um, you know, you could sprain, you know, sprain an arm, sprain a leg, sprain a back. Uh, you could break something. You know, um, if nothing else, you're certainly going to have bruises in places you never ever wanted to have bruises. But um, 
So we want to avoid the 18, um, we want to avoid the term, um, uh, I'm sorry, I'm reading a, a chat and trying to answer at the same time. Never a good idea. We want to avoid 1,800 pounds as much as possible. Uh, we want to lower it to 900, which is still not a walk in a park, but certainly better than 1,800 pounds. Mark Stevens has asked me to explain the term arrest. We are going to stop. Um, in this case, we are stopping a technician who is, has fallen off a beam. We're going to stop the fall in a manner that is the least injurious and the least dangerous to, um, to the technician himself. Okay. So the equipment that you're using in that safety system, whatever it happens to be, um, working together arrests the fall or stops the fall. Um, you know, the alternative being the floor. The floor can arrest the fall too. It's just not nearly as much fun for the technician. Uh, are you good with that, Mark? Okay, cool. Moving on. So as I, this is a class about rescue. And we're gonna have to understand, we should understand a couple of things before we get really into the heart of it. And that's the first thing you need to remember. I always thought it was, um, um, General Patton, who had said that, but he got beat up by this guy by a war. And the second thing that we want to remember and if, and if you'll note who wrote that, I think that he's probably the most qualified person on the planet to write that, that sentence. Uh, <laughs> The reason I bring this up is to help us understand why we need to have a rescue plan that is written and thoroughly rehearsed on a regular basis, uh, not just because the law says so. OSHA, OSHA does indeed require that a rescue plan be in place for every situation where you have a working at height hazard. Um, that does not mean that it is a generic 911 phone call, all right? You know, there are probably certain situations where 911 is the rescue plan, but for the most part, OSHA is looking for a rescue plan that addresses the, the needs of that particular hazard. Now, that hazard may be different if you're working on the loading bridge or on the high steel in an arena or front of house lighting catwalk. All of those are different locations. You're going to need a rescue plan that addresses each one of those locations. You may have a generic rescue plan that covers, you know, the general terms and, and general activities of, a, of what you need to do should somebody take a header off the steel, but you will need sub plans that, uh, address the, the particular areas, okay? So yes, there are regulations and there are ANSI standards that uh, provide guidance in how to do all of these things, all right? So, sorry, the train of, the train of thought just pulled out of the station and I wasn't on it. Uh, <laughs> So we have, we have regulations, we have requirements, um, and these two uh, quotes that I just gave you will give you a clearer idea, not just of the regulations, but quite simply why we need a plan and why we need it rehearsed. First and foremost, hey, as Bill, before you I'm go sorry. on, there's been a request that you put the first quote back. I just did. I'm, I'm being prescient here. I just, put the, I just put it back up. Awesome, thanks. Okay, no, thank you. 
Uh, let's see. Okay. Um, so what does this really mean? If you talk to a safety officer or to people who do training for um, other rescue conditions, other first aid conditions, uh, paramedics, EMTs, those kind of people, um, they understand that you can, you can write a plan, you can rehearse that plan from now until the cows come home, but you're rehearsing it under controlled conditions in an environment that is safe, one would assume. Um, that's not the situation when you uh, are, are, are doing your job for real. I mean, you know, you can, re you can rehearse uh, a five car automob automobile accident with, you know, lots of injuries and stuff and a couple of fatalities. And you can rehearse that with actors and all kinds of stuff. It's going to be very different when you're called to the highway to, uh, to address that. Um, what writing a plan down and what rehearsing it regularly will do is help you limit the amount of the plan that goes away to only a portion. Maybe it's 25%, maybe it's 30, maybe it's 50% of the, of the plan will disappear when you get into real life. If you have rehearsed it, if you have written it down, if everybody understands what roles they need to play. Um, if you don't have that plan, and if nobody understands what roles they're supposed to play, then you're going to lose all of whatever thoughts you may have had about um, uh, about how to get this, you know, this person back to back to safety, back to the ground, whatever the the situation may be. So that's what that means. You know, I'm you know, I've never been in 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 the service. I've never been. In an, an active war zone, and so I don't understand that. I grew up with a twin brother, however, so I think I've got a, a, a hint, at least, of what that might uh, what might, that might feel like. Okay, and this guy, what our friend Stephen King is talking about here, is um, what happens immediately after someone takes a fall. And this is something that I'm going to kind of harp on a fair amount today. Um, you know, it's not, it's not just somebody takes a fall and, oh, well, yeah, oh, look, he's fallen, and we got to go get him. And he's talking to you or she's talking to you. They are talking to you and, you know, while they're hanging there. And everything's fine. You're having a lovely conversation. And it's basically a picnic. That doesn't happen. Um, am I having trouble with my audio? Michael, it looks like maybe it's you. Michael, it looks like maybe it's you. I apologize. You can't apologize for me. <laughs> okay. Um, I don't know how to, to correct it for you. You know, I don't know how to make it better from this end. When somebody takes a fall, that person will have a chemical reaction to what just happened. And that chemical reaction is part of an of a, 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 a instinctual reaction, uh, an automatic thing that you do not have any control over whatsoever. Um, your body will start pumping chemicals yeah, into your body to help you deal, in theory, help you deal with the situation. And the, the biggest chemical that, the, that, that you're going to be getting is adrenaline. And, you know, most of us in this industry, um, yeah, we tend to be adrenaline junkies, but those are in more of a controlled environment as much as a, a load in or a load out can be a controlled environment or, you know, flying Lady Gaga around the, the, the arena. Um, you know, but there's somewhat, there's somewhat controlled environments. We're not in a controlled environment when somebody takes a header off the steel. And adrenaline is now working its way through the victim's body. And the victim is no longer going to be able to function in a normal manner because of that. 
And it's not just the victim, it's also the rescue personnel, the rescue team, the people who are in the room when this happens. It's going to affect them also. And I can't predict what level it will, it will uh, uh, affect people. I don't, I'm sure there's a scientist somewhere who could do that, but I'm not that guy. You know, so I have to assume that there's going to be a significant uh, effect uh, on not only the victim, but the, um, but the people who are going to try and affect the rescue. So that, um, you know, we need to control that adrenaline. We need to reduce that adrenaline. We need to calm the situation down as quickly as possible. Okay, so that's kind of the focus of where we're heading with this class. Okay, so planning a rescue. Well, first of all, let me back up and let me explain where I am, I'm coming from today. Um, I am looking at, we're gonna be talking about a remote assisted rescue. And by that, I mean that to get the victim to the floor will require people to get into various positions and using rescue equipment, they will lower the victim down to the floor. Um, there's a lot of talk about self-rescue. Um, and I think that while self-rescue sounds like a really good idea, boy, wouldn't it be nice if I could just climb my, you know, climb my butt up out of here and get back up onto the steel. I know that the victim is going to be motivated to do that, but I seriously doubt that the victim will have the physical wherewithal. Um, and even if they have the ability, I can't guarantee that they have, they, that, they, that they're not going to do something that's going to exacerbate an injury that they received, that they incurred when uh, they took the fall or the injury that, you know, that, that, that happened that caused the fall. Um, so self-rescue is a challenging, um, challenging way to look at it. And it's especially challenging if the victim happens to be unconscious. And if you've planned for a self-rescue and the victim is unconscious, you got a problem. Uh, so I am looking at, as I said, a remote uh, access uh, rescue. Um, I am not looking at rope access rescue today. I think rope access is a excellent tool to have in the toolbox, but it cannot be. And I repeat, it cannot be the only tool. I, I think it would be extremely unwise for a venue, for an organization, uh, or, or you know, a company to rely on rope access as the sole means of, uh, of rescue. Um, and I say that because it's been my experience when I've been uh, in seminars, in conferences, where they have had uh, rope, ac rope access rescue demonstrations done by professionals in a controlled environment. You know, the victim did not fall, the victim was placed there safely and everything was fine. Then the, 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 the other, the rescuer was going to come down to them. 50% in, in those conditions, 50% of the demonstrations that I have seen have failed. Not catastrophically, you know, they didn't drop somebody down to the floor, but in the operation as they were trying to affect the rescue, discovered that the equipment had jammed up or was misplaced or something had gone wrong and they had to, had to start over again. Um, I am not interested in, I am not interested in uh, uh, getting involved in a, a discipline that I cannot count on. 50% is a bad, bad, bad number, okay? Um, David Glowacki, I will be discussing suspension trauma today. I'm going to save it for towards the end, okay? Um, but I will, I will get into it in detail. It's also called orthostatic, in, uh, orthostatic intolerance uh, or harness trauma. Okay, so knowing that we're talking about a 
uh, remote access rescue. We are using equipment to lower the victim to the, to the ground. Specific equipment, you know, equipment designed to do a rescue. We're not taking, you know, um, uh, some other equipment that happens to be lying around. Although we'll get to that in, in, in a little bit. To plan a rescue, um, you need everybody who's going to be involved in that rescue. This is probably the most important part of a plan and it's the one that most people don't do. They will do, most organizations that I've seen do not do uh, a plan where it involves this group of people. And it has to because A, you don't know who's gonna be in the room. The venue staff, yeah, it's Sunday afternoon and the staff has the day off. It's the crew and that crew can be the house staff and it can also be the overhire or the local crew that typically comes into that venue. It can be the, um, the, the local uh, IATSE crew. You know, it can be whoever is regularly or you know, typically in the building. They need to be part of this plan from start to finish. And equally important, the local authorities, and by the local authorities, I'm talking about, as you say, the rescue squad, the high angle rescue team, whatever that municipality has, that they would, would be the first responders to a suspension, a uh, human in suspension uh, kind of a situation. When I do, or when I did, and hopefully I'll get to do them again, but when I did in-person, um, face-to-face -face class, rescue classes, I made sure that the organization, the venue, whoever was hiring me, invited the local um, fire department, rescue squad, whoever was appropriate, I made sure that they brought them into the venue and they took the class. They didn't always like it at first because I think they felt that there was a certain, you know, you know I don't know, well, for lack of a better phrase, pissing in the corners kind of a thing. Um, and, and um, you know, it took a little while before they understood, the, the, and this be the outside rescuers, the outside department, they understood that they'd never been in that, in that part of the building before. They'd never been backstage. They'd never been up on the high steel in an arena. And they had not a clue. And by the end of the day, everybody was working together. Everybody was helping each other. Uh, there were, were discussions and you know, advice going back and forth from, like say, the, tech, the stagehands to the fire department back, you know. And it created a, a, an environment where people understand that, hey, we don't know what we don't know. We all have to work together. One of the things that you should remember if you're a venue manager uh, or you know, you're just a, you know, a stagehand and happen to be there that day, if there's no other um, considerations put in place and your rescue plan is 911, whoever responds to that will be in charge and they will be 100% in charge, whether it's the police, the fire department, you know, paramedics, whatever. Uh, and that's the way it works. When they come onto a scene, they assume full responsibility and they understand what that means. And they will more than likely, in, in a situation somebody has fallen there, everybody's standing around on stage, they will tell everybody on stage to go sit out in the house and stay out of the way. And then they will go and, and, and deal with the problem. Whether they deal with it correctly or not, or, or safely or appropriately, is a whole nother story but they are in charge unless you make um, some kind of an arrangement with them beforehand so that once again, everybody knows what's going on and, and how we're all going to work together on this situ on this, on this rescue. Uh, all right. Over to the chat room here. Bear with me here. Yes. Uh, bear with me, Judith. Uh, yeah, cool. Well, I'm glad you got to do that. There's nothing wrong. I don't want to give the impression there's anything wrong, wrong with rope access and rope rescue, uh, other than the fact that, you know, 
I have not had good experience in the demonstration mode. Um, that training has to come uh, from a certified trainer, and it's more than likely going to be IRATA or SPRAT. Or, uh, SPRAT. Okay, moving on here. What's my next slide? So let, no, let me, before we get into that, let me go back here. So you're gonna, you're gonna write a rescue plan and it's gonna involve all of the locations and it's gonna identify people who are gonna have specific tasks. And then you're gonna rehearse that, that plan and you're gonna rehearse it at least once a year. I would prefer to see it at least two, maybe three times a year. Um, you're certainly going to rehearse that plan Every time you have somebody new come into the venue, whether you're the, you know, a, new, uh, a new hire, a new employee, for example, um, or maybe the, um, uh, the, the rescue squad in, in the municipality gets a new lieutenant or a new chief or, you know, or something, and they need to, to get this person up to speed. Um, you're gonna do that rehearsal again. The more times that you do that rehearsal, the, more, the better opportunity you're gonna to have to decrease the percentage of the plan that you're going to lose when reality does indeed happen. Okay. Um, all right, moving on. This is a rescue team that I have in, you know, I've done a lot of reading, a lot of research, and taken that information, almost none of which, 99.9% uh, .9 of which, has nothing to do with the entertainment industry and the kind of work we do. Uh, but you take, I take that information and I convert it, I translate it into something that I think is usable for, um, for our industry. Um, this is the best case scenario. Uh, this is, when everything goes, the only thing that has gone wrong is somebody has fallen off the steel and everything else goes right. This is the kind of team you want to put together, right? Now, we all know that Murphy is going to come in and have something to say about this, but you got to start somewhere. And this is the team that I think gets the job done in as quick a manner as possible. And we'll talk about timing and all that when we talk about orthostatic intolerance in a little bit. Five-person rescue team. Um, you can see what their 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 the titles are. Um, the incident command. And actually, should say incident commander. Um, I want that person to be in charge. I don't want that person doing anything else. Always, always, always keep in mind that we are fighting adrenaline. We're fighting panic. We're fi you know. Everybody is operating at 120% with only 50% of the capability. So there are challenges. Um, those of you who will end up handling rope and stuff, you're going to find that your hands are shaking and you will have forgotten to tie, how to tie a clove hitch. I mean, that's the kind of shit that happens. I need somebody who's in charge, somebody who is going to watch everyone else and make sure they're doing their job. This person, this incident commander, cannot do that if they're untangling a rope or if they're running out to the street to tell the rescue squad what door to come in. They can't be in charge. They can't make sure everybody else does their job. And if everybody else doesn't do their job, even one member doesn't do their job, you're screwed. So I want somebody in charge. The up rescuer is the technician that's going to go up to the to the location where the victim has fallen and set in place the rescue gear. And we'll get to that in, in when we start talking about the gear in just a minute. The down rescue person is the person who is going to lower the victim to the floor. Victim communication is really important. You know, I want somebody who is going to continually converse with the, the, with, with the, um, uh, with the victim. You're not only you know, trying to evaluate their condition, you know, you're not, you know, you're trying to determine whether there's more injury there than you, than, than is, than is obvious. Um, you know, if the victim is able to converse with you in a normal manner, you know, probably a couple of octaves higher in, in, in pitch than usual, 
But, um, but if they're, you know, able to answer questions and answer questions correctly and, and, and you know, be relatively coherent, you want to maintain that communication for several reasons. One, you want to evaluate the, um, uh, the, the continued, continued evaluation of the victim. If the victim starts to slur their speech or they start not able to answer questions or they simply pass out, then, then you know that you have more trouble than you originally had. Um, you also are trying to lower the panic quotient by getting the victim to focus on you. You know, you get eye to eye as best you can over 80 feet or whatever. But, you know, you can maintain that eye contact and that verbal contact because you're trying to calm them down. Keep in mind that that victim is hanging, what, 47 and a half feet in the air. And the only thing holding them, the only thing saving them right now is a piece of equipment they can't see. It's probably a piece of wire rope that is connected to their back and they can't see it. So if they can't see it, they don't know how, what's going on. And your brain's going to go to worst case scenario. So you're trying to bring that um, uh, panic quotient down. Uh, the other thing you're going to do, and this speaks to orthostatic intolerance, if the victim is conscious, you are going to remind them that they have to keep moving their legs. You know, ride a bicycle, pretend you're riding a bicycle, swing your legs, you know, wiggle your toes, whatever you are able to do. The communications person is going to have to remind them. Even when we do these in a controlled situation, and I have a victim hanging in the air, and it's just because we placed them there and all that, and it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's just a demonstration. We have to remind the victim to move their legs about every 90 seconds. And, you know, you got to keep doing it because it won't take long at all for you to have a victim pass out on you. Outside communications is just that. Um, you know, I, I, when, I, when I put this in here, I'm thinking more in terms of a, an arena that has multiple entryways. Uh, first, the outside communications person needs to alert the front of house staff or the security or whoever is the person or, or group that you're supposed to, to notify. Um, they're gonna do, they're gonna make that 911 call. And then they're gonna make sure that the EMT, paramedics, the rescue squad, whoever, comes in the right door. You know, it's not hard to imagine a rescue squad riding around a building trying to figure out, how the hell do I get in here? Or they bring, the, they bring in their equipment in the door that looks appropriate, but once you get into the building, you're in the outer ring and you can't, from that door, you can't get the equipment onto the arena floor because it's the wrong door and there are obstructions. Okay, that's the team. Ah. Okay, so up is bad, down is good. And what I mean by that is that when you are affecting a rescue, um, it's unwise in almost all situations. You're going to have to evaluate it yourself, but in almost all situations, it's unwise to bring the victim up. Um, they fall off the steel in an arena. I mean, that's kind of clear. You're, what are you going to do if you get the victim up onto the beam? Um, the potential for injury is pretty high. And, you know, they may not be able, and the, nor should they. You know, you're not going to want, you don't, you're not going to want them walking down the beam. Uh, you know, they're, if nothing else, they're a little woozy. And they'll probably fall off the beam again, which just takes all the fun right out of everything. Um, but, even in a catwalk situation in a theater, um, you got to look at what you have to go through to get the victim back to the ground, which is where they're supposed to be. Right? So if you take the victim up and they're unable to walk and you throw them over your shoulder in a fireman's carry and you walk down the catwalk, up a short ladder, around the ring of the theater, down a spiral staircase to the balcony and down, down all those little teeny tiny steps on the balcony, out the door, you know, you see where this is leading. You're dragging an already potentially injured person around in, in a location that it's just gonna hurt them more. You're gonna make the situation worse. Um, there will be, of course, all I have to do is say you should never bring a victim up and there will be a situation where bringing the victim up is the right thing to do. 
but that's rare. It's very, very rare. You want to take the victim and you want to put them on the ground. So even if you can reach them, you know, they fell off the catwalk, for example, and they're only three feet below the catwalk. Even if you can reach them, my recommendation would be send them to the floor. That's where they're going to be. That's where you want them. And the least injurious way of doing it is lowering them down through the air. There's not much going on there. You're not bouncing on steps or banging your head into the, 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 the treads on a spiral staircase. None of that is any fun at all. All right. Any, uh, ooh, I'm doing my job well. No chats. Okay. Let's see. Well, here's the gear. Um, so yeah, let's talk about the gear. This is a, um, uh, uh, a rescue system that I have put together. I and my team, um, Sarah being one of them, who's on this call. Um, and we evaluated all of the gear that was out there and came up with what we believe to be the most appropriate gear to affect a remote access um, rescue. Let's go to the chat here first. Victim communications up near Vic or below? Good question, Andrew. Excellent question. Below, you know, unless, unless you have the ability to safely get close to the victim. And I, I guess the answer is you get as close to the victim as you can safely get. And by safely, I mean you are standing on a catwalk. You are standing on a platform. You are standing on an area that you cannot fall off of. Um, okay, and somebody wants me to make this full screen. I just did, and let's do it. How's that? Is that better? Well, it's going to have to be because that's all I got. Uh, <laughs> okay, um, so to, Andrew, I think I answered your question. Um, you, you know. You want to be in a safe location. You don't want to be somewhere where you have to pay attention to not falling off yourself. Okay. Uh, you have to be in a place where that's not possible. Uh, clearly the deck is, is a safe place. Um, but you may be able to get to a catwalk uh, or some kind of a platform that, uh, or if nothing else, if it's in a theater, you're up on the balcony as opposed to, uh, standing down on stage and they came off of a front of house you know lighting position so this is the gear that we've put together to make uh to affect a rescue uh, the one difference i can tell you is we have a different pole than this one uh the same clip but a different pole these poles are are, are utility poles they're they're industrial poles and we have switched from this particular pole because we found the locking mechanism. It telescopes out to about 15 feet, and there are uh, three sections, as you can see, by the little locking mechanisms right here. And we found, you know, when I was doing, you know, classes and I was doing, you know, two or three a month, that it didn't take long for that locking mechanism to start wearing out. So we found a different pole, and we actually find we're using a, um, a camera, a, a boom pole, like a mic pole that um, b and sells and it's a twist lock and um, they don't they don't wear out well, at least we haven't found them to wear out yet um, the clip device well i'm getting ahead of myself let me uh, let me let me back up here uh, so we'll talk about the gear in the order of use yeah, wait a second let me back up again it's important that this gear be accessible if you have somebody take a header off the steel and this kit is locked up in the production manager's office and the production manager is on vacation, you obviously have a problem. You know, somebody is going to have to break down that damn door to get the kit out. So you want the kit in the room. And if it's a big room, you know, an arena, for example, or if, for our, my case, uh, you know, the armories in New York City, which can be three, 400 feet long, you know, they're, they're half a city block. Um, you either want a kit in the middle of the room or you want two kits, one towards one end and one towards the other end. You don't want to waste time looking for the kit. 
You want the kit to be packed properly. The kit should be have have you know be organized so that when you open it, the first thing that you need is on top, and then the second thing is next, and then next and next. You don't want to have to go rooting through, you know, because what will what will be happening at that particular point in time is you'll open the kit, you'll be rooting through it, and your hands will be shaking, and you will not have control of that because you know that you got to get this job done, you got to get it done now, and there's that adrenaline thing going on. So make sure that the kit is packed properly and it's in the proper location. And if you're working in a room big enough that you have enough kits. You, know, you don't wanna to have to drag a kit 400 feet to the other end of the room. It's gonna take time and time is something you do not have. So having said all that, um, we start out, well, the other thing to, to, to point out here is you don't, unless you have an absolutely secure place overhead to keep the kit, then you don't keep the kit overhead. Put it on the floor, and when the rescuer goes up, the up rescuer goes up to put the gear in place, they take a rope, and they take up each particular piece of equipment one at a time. That takes a little longer. I know it sounds like it takes a little bit longer, but in reality, it's a lot shorter than having the entire kit spill its contents from the beam and drop them 70 feet to the floor. So one at a time with a rope from the floor. We start with this device. And this is, this is my favorite of, of all of this equipment. Inside this little pouch is a web ladder. It's 16 feet, I'm sorry, 15 feet long. And it's just like, it's like an etrier, you know, it's got web rungs on it. Um, it's got a Velcro closure here. So the first, if your victim is conscious and reasonably coherent, if you think that they will be able to take direction, to follow your commands, you bring this piece of kit up, you clip this into a location overhead that is strong enough to support the weight of the victim and you know you know i'd say another 10 or 20 percent for you know so for bouncing around and you clip it in take out the ladder and toss it down to them now what you have just done is given them a lifeline you have given them something they can hold on to i do not want the victim to try and climb out and believe me they're not going to be able to climb out on this thing it is hard as hell even when you know you're you're in good shape and 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 you know you're not 47 feet in the air it's a pain in the butt to try and climb out but what you can do is stick your foot into one of those loops and your elbow into the crook of your elbow into another one of those loops and now you have something tangible to hold on to something that is taking the fear of the retractable lifeline or whatever is connected to your dorsal ring and worrying about that failing you've now taken that away so now you have lowered the, 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 um, the, the, the uh, panic level significantly. It also gives them an opportunity. You know, they can sit down there and they're, you know, they're putting their weight in there. They have bent their knee so they can, you know, they can move around. Now, they're, now they're, they're, they're fighting off the orthostatic intolerance issues that you could partially, potentially run into. If the victim's not conscious, don't bother with this. Leave it, you know, throw it away. The next thing that will go up is a slow descent device. And this slow descent device will allow you to lower the victim in a controlled manner. Uh, uh, that's why we call it a slow descent device. It has a little friction break inside the head block and the head block is double reeved. So even if you were to let go, um, the victim will not come hurtling to the floor. They will come down in a slow, controlled manner. What you want to do before you know, the accident happens, when you're setting up the kit, is you want to separate the, the head and tail block by you know, 8, 9, 10 feet or so so that you don't have to mess with it so much to reach the victim. Having to extend or shorten the, the block and tackle it's difficult under the best of circumstances, and these are most definitely not the best of circumstances. So you wanna get that, that line, that, that distance, roughly around where you think some, you're gonna need it. 
So you, you don't have to do as much adjustment or as little adjustment as possible. You could this guy into something overhead, again, once again, is robust enough to support the victim plus 20%. Um, and then you take the carabiner in the tail block, open it, it's a twist lock, right? And, and uh, it's a, a two stage, so you have to uh, raise it, uh, you have to open it, push on it and then twist it and that's the way that it'll open. And then with it open, you place it in this device right here, and this device will keep the gate open. You extend the pole, you reach over to what's probably their dorsal ring, it's probably where they're clipped into, and that will probably be a few inches above their head, or at least even with you know, the back of their head. Um, you'll be able to um, clip the carabiner into that dorsal ring, and then you push, and twist with the pole a little bit and pull on the, on the rope. On, you've got a handful of rope here, pull on that. And the pole comes away, leaving you connected to the victim. The pole does come with a, um, a lanyard on it so you can clip it into something so that it doesn't go crashing to the floor and impale one of the, uh, one of the rescuers. Okay. Um, I will tell you that this clip is the best one that we have found. It is not great in and of itself, but it's still the best one that we have found that is generic in nature. There are a couple of, of, of products on the market um, that, you know, the, 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 the holding device is pretty sexy, but it only works with equipment from that particular manufacturer. You need to do your homework and find out what kit. There are a bunch of kits on the market. I'm not suggesting that you have to go out and buy this kit. There are a bunch of kits. Do your homework. Find out which one you think is going to be the most beneficial to you. And if nothing else, you need to practice putting this beaner into that clip because under the best of circumstances, it's not a lot of fun. So, the slow descent device is hanging from the building. You're connected to the victim. You're going to be able to raise the victim. Yeah, maybe raise them a couple of inches. If they're on a lanyard, you will disconnect the lanyard and, you know, so that we can lower them to the floor. If they're on a self-retracting device, and if that device is long enough to reach, to allow the victim to reach the floor, then you do that. You leave them, leave them connected. Why not? And then you get them down to the floor. We put in, you know, some round slings and stuff to give you other places to anchor. Maybe, you know, you need, you're going around a three inch pipe and this won't fit around a three inch pipe. You can choke some slings around that. I mean, we, we give you some, some alternatives, some options. Um, the rope and the figure eight. We also give you an extra beaner or two just for, because who knows, as a, a, fr a fellow trainer uh, who I, I've known for years, he says, yeah, you can never have enough carabiners. This is just simply not possible to do. Um, we give, in, in worst case scenario, we give you a piece of rope. That rope is usually 100 feet long and a figure eight. And we give this to you in the kit because there is going to be a one in a million chance that you're going to have to go down to the victim. Right. Maybe the victim is not hanging in a way where you can get to them properly. I don't know what it would be, but we give you that option. Keep in mind, please, that going to a victim, a conscious victim in particular, is the worst thing you can do. You know, you're putting the rescuer at risk by sending them over the side, and then they're going to get down to the victim, and you know, it's not going to go well because the victim is not operating on all full, you know, on all cylinders and you know, you really, 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 really want to avoid going down to the victim. Um, I have in the past suggested to my folks um, that if we're going to give um, the, the kit, we're going to put in the kit the rope and the figure eight, that we also should put a baseball bat into the kit so that we can control the victim. But uh, they won't let me do that. All right, and then we're going to get and lower the victim down to the floor. Um, I'm going to, it's, yeah, it's three o'clock. I'm going to stop here 
and shift over to the discussion of orthostatic intolerance, which is also called suspension trauma. Um, and then we're gonna circle back at the end to discuss what to do with the victim when you get down to the floor. And Camille, I haven't forgotten, we wanna talk about um, uh, setting up a mock rescue. I have not forgotten that. And I think some other people had some questions too. Please don't let me forget what they are. So let's go, what's here? Um, this is an interesting article that's in, uh, that OSHA put out. It's a magazine article. Um, it's a little long in the tooth right now. I don't think they've updated it, but it helps you understand the risks of suspension trauma. And that is the name of the article, and these are the, uh, um, uh, the authors. So if we're going to talk about suspension trauma, we have to talk about the Queen of England. Um, the caption on that photograph or photographs like it will refer to the, uh, the weather. You know, it's a particularly hot day and our, our Queen's Guard fellow here passed out due to the, to the, to the to heat. Uh, as Michael Powers will tell you, um, heat had nothing to do with it. The man locked his knees and created an orthostatic intolerance condition where the blood going to his legs had no ability to get out of his legs. And his, the, you know, the, the, your legs have enough capacity to take about you know, five eighths, I believe it is, of your blood, the volume of your blood, and store it in your legs. And there's no way for it to get out because the way the blood gets out of your legs is for you to move your legs. And when you move that and your muscles push the, um, um, the blood, push the veins, push the arteries, and they literally help pump the blood back up to your torso so that it can get to your heart and then your heart does what it's supposed to do. There's also these really cute little one-way valves in your veins and, and in the arteries, um, but that's a different seminar. So. so he locked his knees. You've seen this in YouTube videos, the groom or the bride passing out at uh, the altar or whatever, where they're getting married. And they talk about the excitement of the day or maybe the excitement of the night before or whatever. That has nothing to do with it. They passed out because they locked their knees. The blood went to their legs and stayed there. And what happens then is that your heart starts looking for blood to pump and you know, increases heart rate for a few seconds or so. You know, you start, it starts pumping really, really quickly, looking for something to pump, doesn't find any, and goes into self-preservation mode. And when it does that, your heart rate goes down into the toilet. I mean, you're barely alive at this stage of the game. And your brain goes, oh, well, I can fix this. And it causes the victim to pass out. This victim here, this Queen's guard, passed out, fell over, and solved the problem. Because now he's horizontal, the blood can get out of his legs, up to his heart, and he's all good. Um, that condition isn't what we run into because we don't get the falling out part, falling over part. We're in a harness, we're hanging from the, the building steel. We cannot fall over. So we don't get to actively get ourselves out of this condition unless we are able to move our legs. And this is the key to the whole thing is that as long as you can move your legs, you can extend your suspension situation, not indefinitely, mind you, but you know, significantly longer because you are allowing blood, you are forcing the blood to get back up to your heart. This condition happened to me, and I use this as an example of the timing of this, uh, because the medical community isn't really terribly helpful. Um, but I was doing a class in Helsinki, and we had some rigs put, and we were going to do some performer flying after the, the rescue stuff. And I had, um, some of you may know David Hearn, a buddy of mine who does flying by foy stuff. Uh, he was with me and I was in a harness and I asked him to pick me up off the floor. I wanted to show the students what it looked like hanging in a harness. And, you know, I was just hanging there and I continued to teach. Um, being half Italian, I kept using my hands, but I wasn't paying any attention to my legs at all. And at some point, 
I started to feel woozy. I felt uncomfortable, didn't feel right. And I turned to David and I asked him to put me down on the deck. At least that's what I thought I said. You know, I thought I said, I don't feel well, put me down on the deck. What I really said was, I really, 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 you know, I was not making any sense at all. Fortunately, David understands my, my gibberish usually. And he did indeed put me down on the deck. And um, once my feet hit the floor, the condition went away and I felt fine. You know, it was almost instantaneous. Um, that, they were taping the, uh, the session. So we could go back and look at the video. And it was five minutes, and I believe it was five minutes and 35 seconds into this when I started to suffer the, the, uh, the effects of orthostatic intolerance. One of the insidious things about orthostatic intolerance, is, I mean, it's caused by a lack of oxygen to the brain. That's what you know, ultimately causes you to pass out. Um, so you're not, you're not functioning properly, and you don't necessarily know that you're not functioning properly. But the color had already gone from my face. And you could see me turn and you know, do my gibberish nonsense to Dave before, I came, before he put me down on the floor. Five minutes, 33 seconds. The medical community isn't really terribly concerned about timing the onset because they know that different people react differently, different body types, different condition. Are you fit? Are you not fit? You know, what were you doing earlier? What you had for breakfast? What did you do last night? All that stuff's going to play into how long it happens. But I think on average, you can count on between five and 10 minutes before the onset of um, orthostatic intolerance. It's probably not going to last longer than 10 minutes. And keeping in mind, if you're unconscious, if the victim is unconscious, this does not stop the clock. This just means that we've got to get you down faster because we have no way of getting you to move your legs, getting you to help alleviate or mitigate the uh, orthostatic intolerance problem. So five to 10 minutes is for the, the beginning, the, the onset. The end result, you know, how long you have before you actually die in the harness, the medical community is not helpful. They argue about it. You can talk to five different doctors, you'll get 10 different answers. But in general, they argue between 30 and 60 minutes. 30 and 60 minutes. If you've got a victim hanging 65 feet in the air and you don't know where the rescue kit is or you don't have a rescue kit or you have the wrong rescue kit or if you don't know what you're doing at all 60 minutes is going to go away in a heartbeat and you'll lose you'll lose a, a, the victim this points to the need for rescue and you know rescue plans uh, to be in place and functioning properly so that they are written and well rehearsed. And one of the things I, I, should, I probably should, well, I know I should have said this earlier, way, way back in the beginning. Um, you know, rescue is becoming a known entity in the entertainment industry, but it is by no means all that prevalent. Uh, any of you who are climbing for work, you know, what you do on the mountainside is entirely up to you. But if you're climbing for work, you're in a venue, you have every legal right to ask whoever is in charge, do you have a rescue plan for where I am about to go? If I fall off of that I-beam over there, how are you gonna get me down? And if they cannot answer you in an appropriate manner, you have the legal right to say, well then, I am not going up there. It's, I mean, if nothing else, it's simply not worth it, right? You know, if you're going to go up there, you're going to take a header off the steel and they can't get you down except, you know, by waiting for the fire department to come in with, you know, their hook and ladder truck and try and get it into the building. You know, it's not going to go well. But you have a legal right to say no. Just toss that out there. How you deal with that, I mean, our industry has been a challenge that way. Okay, so what's next here? Oh, that was the end of the slide. For, we'll come back to that later. So we've got, before I move on to t answering some of the other questions, um, you know, how to set up a, 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 a rehearsal uh, in training, are there any questions that um, come up with orthostatic intolerance or some of the other topics that I've covered? 
Wow. And we still have 53 people in the room. I'm impressed. Okay. Um, Bill, there still are a couple of questions in the chat. Oh, it's not showing on my screen. Might need to scroll up. No, it's just. Uh, oh, right. Okay. Um, Safety not on the end of the descenders rope. Right. Oh, I'm, I'm just, I'm sorry. I'm scrolling up. I, um, I did not see these. For some reason, the chat was not indicating on my screen. I don't know why. Let me get back here. Thoughts on use, let me see if you can, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm scrolling up to where we were the, the last question. I missed a bunch of them. Gear set or double as, Andrew, you have to translate your question. Gear set or double as Vic access. Um, I'm not sure I understand that question. Okay, we'll come back to it. Camille. Yeah, I don't, you know, you know, I don't know. I can't, I think it's going to be different for every victim. Um, you know, the goal here is to get the victim to focus on you not on um, uh, the floor or, you know, the catwalk, you know. Um, the closer you can get safely to the victim, the better off you're going to be, whether it's above or below, I don't think. Um, um, I don't think it matters all that much. Um, safety knot. Now, this is something that I did not point out because it's not in that photograph. We use um, a dead man. We provide, it's not in that picture of the kit, and I, I apologize, I've been meaning to get it in there, but I keep forgetting. Uh, but we use a dead man, which is a, um, an ascender, basically, that we put on the, the line that you are uh, using to rescue the victim, the, 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 the standing line of the block and tackle, and then we clip it into the rescuer's harness into a you know a, a hip ring or something so that should the rescuer have a problem should they pass out or something go wrong um the descender will not allow them to come down at all and then one of the other communicators whoever's standing there can come over and take over to continue lowering the victim to the ground okay i don't think a safety knot is a great idea because um chances are you're gonna tie it in a place where it'll hit the head block and the victim won't be all the way down to the ground and then you'll be screwed. Um, Paul, Patrick, um, that's entirely possible. I don't wanna put more people at risk overhead than absolutely necessary. You keep in mind that the victim has probably removed the safety device, if they were on a horizontal lifeline, it's probably not accessible to the rescuer and the rescuer is going to have to do something, you know, a bit jerry-rigged, you know, probably run a sling around the beam that they're crabbing out on. Um, I don't want to put more people up there than necessary, but if, 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 um, if that works, go for it. Yep, bend your knees. Yeah, not everybody remembers it. And uh, David, you're right, and, and they pay the price. Thank you, Sarah. You're welcome, baby. Um, is it okay if I share the link to the OSHA webpage on this? Uh, yes, please, please. So do. the chicken that's in the fridge, does that go in the freezer too? Oh, I'm getting something else. I don't know oh, if anybody, okay. I'm getting okay. crosstalk. I don't know if anybody else is. Um, I'm getting crosstalk from something else. That's all right, took care of it. Okay, thank you. Um, use sternal ring to lower. I would never use a sternal ring if I, unless I absolutely had to. The victim will be in a very challenging position. Their arms will be thrown behind them. Um, their head will be tossed behind them. Um, yeah, unless you absolutely have to, I would not do it. Bad idea. Um, exercises or movements we should be concerned with. 
Let me speak to this, David, in a couple of minutes. We're going to talk about what happens with the victim to the floor. Um, James, I, you know, it's an acceptable part of a plan, but I still would not count on it. For example, you know, if you come off the loading bridge and you come on off on the arbor side and you have a lanyard that allows you to get down in that hole in between the loading bridge and the T-track and, T, T and you hit your head on an arbor and knock yourself out, self-rescue will no longer be an option. So I think self-rescue is okay to plan. It, it can be, certainly can be one of your plans, but everybody's got to have uh, an option to, um, to get you out when you're incapacitated. Cindy, I'm going to come back to that one. Um, I think that the, uh, Andrew, I think that the gear setter can talk to, but the, you know, I would prefer that the focus, the victim's focus was on another individual, the, um, um, uh, the, the person, the upriver, the rescuer, has got a job to do, and they need to focus on that. If they get into a conversation, the victim may take them into a conversation that precludes them from paying attention to the work that they're supposed to be doing. So I would prefer that the victim had someone to communicate who is separate from the, the up rescuer. That being said, all bets are off when you, when you have uh, only three people in the room and, you're gonna have, and people are gonna have to share duties because you just don't have five people in the room. Um, Paul, there, a sample example format, there are all over the, the, uh, uh, the internet. Um, you know, I can't say that one method is better than another, other than you need to do some homework. This is serious stuff. You're trying to save somebody's life. So you need to do some homework and find a plan that works for your venue or find a couple of plans and cobble them together into something that you and your people are comfortable using. All right, we're gonna to get to that. I think that that's what we're gonna to have to go to next because people, right, oh, and you're right. Okay, we're gonna, we're, we're, let's go to, um, we may end up, well, we'll see what kind of time. Um, what to do with the victim when you get them down to the floor. This is a huge part of the rescue. What you really, 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 underline the word really, need to have happen is to have the medical personnel in the room before the victim gets to the floor unless you or someone on your team has the medical um, knowledge, you know, you're a paramedic, for example, um, and you have the, um, what's the best word? You have, you, you know, you have the ability to make an accurate assessment of the victim's condition. You don't want to guess. Um, having the medical people in the room makes, takes that away from you, takes that, that, that challenge away from you, and they know what they're doing. So they're going to tell you what to do when the victim gets down to the, to the floor. Now, if the victim, if you don't have the, the, the if the victim is, gets down to the floor before you have medical people in the room, once again, we have a medical profession not helping us. You can get, oh, at least three different um, answers to what to do with the victim. First and foremost, the one answer, the, the, the clear answer is if the victim is not breathing, you know, you got to, you know, you have to deal with that. If there are other condi medical conditions that the victim may be going through, um, you know, diabetic thing, a heart attack, whatever, you know, but if they're not breathing, that you have to deal with first because you don't get them breathing, you don't need anything else. So, you get a victim down, they're not breathing, you put them on the floor and you do CPR, you get them breathing. You lay them on the floor. You know, then 
if you get them breathing, then you can start figuring out what to do with, with the person once they are breathing. And hopefully by then you've got the uh, paramedics in the room. If the victim comes down and they are in reasonably decent shape, they are coherent or even just relatively coherent. Oh hell, even if they're unconscious, but if they are um, breathing and there is no outward signs of anything, you know, they don't have a, a compound fracture, for example. Um, my suggestion, and I want to be very, very clear about this. This is my suggestion. I'm not a doctor, but I have talked to a lot of doctors. And in talking with a lot of doctors, I have come to the decision that if there is nothing else, no other extenuating circumstances, the best thing to do is to sit them in a chair, bring the victim down, sit them in a chair, take off the descent device. Do not mess with the harness. Do not mess with them and get the damn medical people into the room. I think you can see how clearly how important this is. You need to know what to do with the victim. You will get people who tell you to lay them on the floor. You will get other people to say, curl them up in a fetal position on the floor. All of these people are trying to address and assess different medical conditions that they are speculating might happen. Um, and I, I get it, and those things may happen. But you know, when you have no other alternative, you have no other uh, advice, you have no one who can you know, tell you decidedly what to do, then I think that putting them in a chair is probably the safest thing you can do. And get the medical people in there. Okay. But again, I'm going to repeat, this is, um, this is my advice. I'm, I stand by it. I have no problem saying this out loud, but I want you, to, you, know, I want you to, to understand that my advice is coming from the research that I have done. I've had doctors tell me, lay them down. Oh, sure. Put them in a fetal position. The majority of people that I have spoken with have said, put them in a chair and here's why. It does the least amount of harm in a situation where you don't know what condition the victim really is in, unless they are able to tell you. Okay, how are we doing on chat here? Yeah, for some reason it's not, um, it's not showing. Airway, breathing, circulation, yeah. Um, the other thing about a victim um, and when the medical personnel get into the room, I'm sure that they will make certain that this happens. But if, you know, if you have a victim, a fallen, a victim who has fallen, um, don't let them talk you into letting them go home. They go to the hospital, they get evaluated. Too many people uh, in other accident situation, you know, drowning for, for example, too many people have, um, you know, been macho about it. Um, and, um, you know, they say, oh, I'm fine. They get them out of the water. I'm fine. Everything. But they go home and six hours later, they die in bed. You know, they drown in bed. So you don't want that kind of situation. You also don't want the victim to wander off. Um, even if they're fine. You know, in many cases, you will find or the victim will determine, that, discover that the only thing, you know, bad that has happened is that they've had a kind of a biological moment. And they're going to want to go into the restroom and, and get cleaned up. Um, yeah, don't do that. Because when they go into the restroom and they pass out in a stall, it's really hard to get a victim out of a stall when they've passed out. It's just not any fun at all. Put them in his chair. Get your, your medical personnel in here. Um, yes. Read what you has said. Um, I don't have time to, um, uh, to get into big de details about this, but making sure that you have established with your medical people, the outside people, the rescue squad, or making sure that you have the correct terminology is extremely important so that you get the right people into the room. 
You know, if you don't have the right terminology, you may end up at the police department in the room and they're not going to be helpful. You know, it's not their job. So have the right terminology and that will determine what kind of uh, personnel you get and they will indeed have uh, the necessary tools to deal with the situation. Um, if you're going to set up your own test, if your own demonstration, your own rescue, uh, the things that you have to remember are that everybody responds to being in a harness differently and it is not common, but it's also more common than you would think that you, hang, you put a victim in a harness and their body says, oh no, and they pass out after 20 seconds. You know, there are people who are built that way and they do not suffer being in a harness. You know, they don't, they don't, they, they, they can't tolerate it. So you have to be aware of that. You have to have all of the safety precautions in place so that you can get a victim down um, without doing the, 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 the rescue um, rehearsal, but just getting a victim down because they are, they are in distress. Typically when I do a, a rescue demonstration, um, we will use a lift where we will take, we'll hang a, a self-retracting device from overhead um, and that's for the victim. And we'll hang another point overhead for the rescuer to clip the, um, um, uh, the various devices in. So we'll hang a couple of points so they could clip in the, 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 uh, the ladder, the rescue ladder, and, uh, and then clip in the, safe, the, the slow descent device. And we do these 10, 15, maybe 20 feet off the floor. We do not do it from the high steel. It's pointless. You know, it's not, it's not going to be helpful um, if somebody comes off the high steel uh, during a rehearsal. It's just, you know, it's just not, it's not the way to go. So we'll hang a self-retracting device. We'll take a victim, the potential victim, up in a lift and clip them into that self-retracting device and we will lock it in place. We'll yank on it, lock it in place. And then we will have the victim bend their knees so that they take their own weight. What you do not want to have happen is pushing the button of the lift to lower to get, you know, to lower to get out from under the victim, because that's not a, a, a subtle drop. That is a jolt and you don't want to hurt the person, you know. Um, be right with you, Andrew. Um, you know, you don't want to hurt the person. Uh, you don't want to um, put a, a, a shock, a shock load into, into their system because, eh, you know, this may be the day that they can't tolerate it and, you know, they pass out or they're injured. Allow the, um, um, the victim to take their own weight on the uh, self-retracting device. Um, then lower the lift, move it away, but don't go far with it because you may need to bring it right back to go get the victim. And we use, usually if we have the, and if we have the, the, the wherewithal, we have a second lift that we use as the rescue platform so that the rescuer, the up rescuer is in uh, the lift and goes up and sets the points in place and does all the things that they need to do. Um, let's see here, Andrew, how much difference does padding, um, proper padding fitting make to prolong suspension trauma? Um, harnesses can kill you if you're, um, we did this in the class, um, that was the first class we did was the harnesses, right? Yeah, harnesses can, can kill you if they don't fit properly. Um, if they are, if they fit you properly, um, they protect you from a fall, you know, from serious injury when you fall, but they are not overly helpful um, while you're hanging there. I don't, because what's going on, especially with orthostatic intolerance, has nothing to do with, with you know, the harness or how loose or how tight the harness is. It's the fact that you're not moving your legs. Uh, if you have a harness that doesn't fit you properly and you take a fall, it's going to do more damage to you. Um, uh, it could potentially choke you to death. I uh, mean, it certainly can do, like I said, bruises and bumps in places that you don't ever, ever want to have bruises. 
Uh, thank you for thank you for um, for that information. The the key here, folks, is for you to know what your municipality, your location requirements are. What are their capabilities? How do you establish that? And and you know make that part of your written rescue plan so that you know that you know the the key word that you when you call into 911 is beetlejuice i mean it's something whatever it happens to be whether it's you know suspended worker or suspension trauma you know they're going to tell you what the key words are so they can direct their uh, their call the call to the right department um how are we doing here? No, oh, we're right on 3.30 here. Um, Camille, did that answer your question about setting up a mock, um, a mock rescue or, you know, a rehearsal? Sort of. Okay. Um, there's not a lot else to it, really. I mean, in theatrical, when we're in a theater location, um, we find balconies, we find um, uh, places, you know, the grid, to suspend the equipment from, but typically the rescuer is going to be in some sort of lift. Um, and then, um, you, know, you know, with the gear, I mean, we'll do things like, we'll take the gear, we'll, we'll hide the kit, and we won't tell, we'll put together the team, send them out of the room, and then we'll hide the kit, and make them find the kit before they start the rescue. Uh, if an SRD is used, no, it does not. You're not doing, you're, you're not, uh, I don't want a static line on the victim. I want an SRD because I can release the tension. I can release the lock on an SRD and get them down to the floor quicker than if I have to disconnect a, um, a static line from them. Okay, uh, that would be my my my, uh, my my primary concern. What else we got? That looks to be it. Um, it's a complicated situation. Let me le uh, let me leave you with with one piece of advice. Um, if um, we've talked about this rescue kit, you know, and a remote access rescue. If you're in a situation where the victim is 20 feet off the floor and you have a 25 foot tall genie and you can safely put the genie underneath the victim, you should do that. I know that the genie law says you're not allowed to put two people in a one person lift. Um, Primarily, that means that the genie will not raise if it's got too much weight in it, but it will come down. So put one person in it, go up, get the, the, the victim, and bring them down to the floor. Forget all this nonsense and all this equipment in, this, in, the, in the rescue kit. Um, you want to do the most expedient thing possible and do no harm. You know, the goal is to get the victim down to the floor um, as quickly as possible. And you, want, you don't want to do, you don't want to increase their injuries. You don't want to exacerbate that which they have already gone through. Ideally, do you want an SRD long enough for the victim to be lowered to the ground so it does not need? Um, yeah, yeah, it, it, well, it should be. If, it, if it's a training exercise, it definitely should be. Um, um, how much for the setup? Um, your my kid's cheaper, but I don't know exactly. Sarah, if, you know, can you go online and and whoop? Sarah, you're ahead of me once again. There's the link to our kit. How about a chain hoist? Um, to lower a victim down to the floor. Um, yeah, you could do that. I mean, it's not, and I'm doing finger quotes here, uh, it's not legal because you're not supposed to do that with a chain hoist. But if that's the expedient method, then go ahead. 
Keep in mind, however, that the, the, the motion of lowering a, a victim down to the floor wants to be as smooth as possible so that you don't exacerbate any existing injuries or something that was caused during the fall. And you know the ratcheting effect of a chain hoist as those links go through the machine is um, um, it's bouncy and uh, it will it will that will transmit that will run through the victim also and it may not be uh, uh, fun for them to have that happen yeah it's, as cindy said it's it's a bumpy ride at the end of the day folks you have to have a plan you have to rehearse it and it has to make sense for your venue you can go online and you can get all of the rescue plans that are on online and put them all together read go through all of them none of them as far as i've ever found none of them really relate to what we do and you know you can cherry pick specific things from them They'll have ideas that, oh, yeah, that, that's a great idea. I can use that to get my, my, my victim down from the balcony rail, for example. And that's terrific. But you can't just rely on, you know, downloading something and taking it and running with it. Oh, rescue kit inspection. Uh, rescue kits get inspected after use every time you use it. Um, every time, whether it's uh, the real thing or, um, or uh, a rehearsal. Um, clearly, you're not going to do inspection before you use it um, if you're in an emergency situation, if somebody is indeed hanging. You're not gonna spend time uh, inspecting the, uh, the gear then, and I would, I would doubt the veracity of that inspection. Uh, but you make sure that the kit is inspected every time you use it, um, and then somebody should go back and check it every once in a while because you don't know. Maybe somebody was messing around with it. Maybe somebody opened it up, didn't know what it was, and you know, pulled it out, looked at it, and put it back together again, but didn't pack it properly or something. So uh, after every use and a periodic inspection, you know, a couple of times a year would be a really good idea. It's okay. And as far as inspection is concerned, it's, 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 you know, what you would expect. <laughs> yeah, they do that. Yeah. Um, I'm not saying my kid is, is, would, has eliminated that, but we, we, we pack ours in a, um, in a fiber, it's in a, a, a fiber case. Um, it's a wheeled, um, um, hard-sided case. Once again, it's a it's a microphone and and camera case that uh, we use. Yeah, the fiber case. It's got to be a good, thick, strong one because mice are really persistent. You know, those those soft those kind of soft fiber cases they'll go through. They, if they if there's something on the inside they want, they'll go through that case too. If you have no other questions, um, we're good. I'm happy to answer more questions. I don't have uh, I don't have a schedule, but we are done with the scheduled time for this class. Okay. What is the length of the rescue pole when retracted? Um, four feet. We worked really hard to get a pole that would close up uh, and fit in the case because uh, we found that when we had the case, we used a bag for a while and the pole was separate from the bag. And of course, the client, the customer would lose the pole. Um, well, you're going to be looking for, it's, it's a synthetic rope. It's, you're going to be looking for um, uh, the you know rips and tears is pretty much all that um, you're, you, you sh it should be possible to have happen to it. Um, you know it's a it's a polyester line, um, so heat would be a problem. But you should not be in a, uh, in, a in an area 
that involves high heat. And if you are in a spot that involves a lot of heat, my recommendation, this is a rescue line, um, my recommendation would not to bother inspecting it, I would, I would replace it. And I'm not saying that just because you could buy it from me, you can buy it from anybody. But, um, you know, you don't want to, you don't want to mess with that. If you know that, you know, your line in the rescue was running over, you know, some, some old conventionals that were still lit and they were really hot and the, you know, the line got all fouled up in them or something like that. I wouldn't even bother inspecting and I would just get rid of it and I would go for a new one. Well, you know, um, depends on the kit you have. This is to Michael King. Uh, it depends on the kit you have and how many people need to affect a, a safe rescue. Um, some kits, mine included, if you have a victim that's coherent and conscious um, and helpful, then you can do it with one other person. It'll take a while, but you can do it with one other person. Uh, ideally, yeah, I mean, five people in a room is, is not going to happen, but you got to have at least two other people in the room so that you have a victim and at least two people. Um, any more than that, and, you know, it's just all, it's, it's, it's that much better. Getting people out of a fly house grid. Um, this is typically not going to be a fall situation. It's probably a medical emergency. Um, you know, and if they're in a harness, it, it, it kind of depends on where they are on the grid, um, <laughs> how big your loft wells are and how big your victim is, whether they'll fit through one of those or not. Um, it's hard to say, Cindy, because, you know, you could, you could, you could do it with the, the slow descent device. There's certainly going to be plenty of steel overhead to clip into, but um, it's a question of where the hole is to get them through the grid, you know, down through the grid. Typically, what would happen is you would get the victim across the grid over to the loading bridge. You don't have to get them down to the loading bridge, but you, there's that opening between the loading bridge and the grid itself, because the loading bridge is hopefully going to be six or seven feet below the grid, so that they can come down and you can kind of ease them over the railing of the loading bridge and then down to the floor through that opening. Ladder hole and wells. Well, you know, the ladder hole is the other option. Um, you're going to have to go down with them so that they don't get caught up on a rung, you know, get a leg on the other side of a rung and, and then, you know, you, you know, they get tipped over or just all caught up in it. Uh, Michael, uh, I can't answer to... Um, to uh, a mountain climbing rope, but I can say that uh, industrial rope that I would prefer people use in entertainment rigging um, is industrial rope and it's designed for people to step on it and people to run over it with the forklift and not cause any, any problem. But not everybody does that. You know, a lot of people go out and buy a specialty rope that um, they get all bent out of shape when somebody steps on it. Right. Thanks, Camille. Good answer. Yeah, unless with crampons. Yeah. Oh, that would that would be a problem. Okay, folks. I think um, I think we're good. If you ever have any questions, please um, uh, feel free to drop me an email, and um, we'll be back next week with more working at height stuff. Thank you so much for taking the time out today and have a good rest of the afternoon. And for those of you overseas, go back to bed, okay? <laughs> Thank you, take care.